the election of Donald Trump, I think, would be deeply bearish for oil. Um, bearish? Think, Why is that? Very, very bearish for oil. Because he would, he would cut a peace deal. He said so on the campaign trail. Um, he, like, he's, we did not have a war when Donald Trump was president. Whatever you think of the man. And Lord knows he's an in- interesting person to observe agnostically as a nonpartisan like we are. Um, he has said explicitly that um, he would cut a deal with Putin. He would stop the war in the Middle East. If it, those two things happened, I think oil re-rates at $50 a barrel overnight. Doomberg returns to the show. Uh, he's one of the authors of The Collective known as Doomberg. Check them out on Substack. We'll put the link down below. Uh, they're experts on the energy sector. We'll be talking about energy today. The biggest forces driving the energy markets and the most recent headlines driving oil and gas and uh, other commodities. Thank you very much for returning to the show. Doomberg, good to see you. David, great to see you. Congratulations on the show's success. It's amazing to watch from afar and always happy to come on when, uh, when you invite us. Thank you very much. Uh, lots is going on in the oil market. We are going to get to your overall outlook on oil and, and gas for the remainder of the year. Let's run through some headlines that came out of this week. So Ukrainian drone hits Russia's third biggest refinery. Damage is not critical. Uh, the, um, the drone strike uh, damaged the refinery. The, the refinery has a capacity of roughly 340,000 barrels per day. Um, and Ukrainian intelligence, I'm reading a Reuters article, Ukrainian intelligence source says Ukraine hit the primary refining oil uh, unit at the oil refinery in Russia's highly industrialized Tatarstar uh, region and caused a fire. Such attacks are intended to reduce Russia's oil revenue, the source said. How significant is this attack on the overall production of oil from Russia? I would say if you ask me to describe the state of the energy markets today, there's only one parameter that matters, and it's geopolitical risk. And the story that you just quoted is an example of that. I would also say what's going on in the Middle East is also pretty um, worrisome from an energy perspective. If you look across the primary energy complex today, uh, there's an abundant supply of natural gas, which is basically in a glut. Um, coal is back to pretty reasonable prices as well when measured against their energy content. Um, oil is the one primary energy input that is trading uh, at elevated prices relative to the others. And the, the big difference, we believe, is this geopolitical risk. Um, if it weren't for the war in the Middle East and what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, it is our view that oil would probably be trading closer to 40 to $50 a barrel versus $90 Brent that we see today. And so, uh, you know, um, obviously just a gross estimate, but I think the, the, the geopolitical risk premium embedded in oil today is somewhere between 30 and $40 a barrel. And I would also say that these attacks by Ukraine on Russian refineries um, is being done at the pro- over the protest of, of the U.S. government and the Biden administration. Uh, this is not what they would like Ukraine to be doing. Um, I think they may have perhaps read some Doomberg articles and decided that you can't um, reduce Putin's revenue by um, by attacking his volume. You have to pump the market, flood the market, and reduce the price. And this geopolitical risk premium, ironically, is feeding Putin's war machine, which is outproducing NATO today. And, and it is why I think we're seeing uh, a beginning realization in the Western media that the war is not going so well. And so this is counterproductive. Um, but I think that's where we are today. And so if you ask me for my outlook for oil for the rest of the year, it all depends on whether we see escalation in Iran slash Israel Middle East um, and whether or not um, you know NATO's response to Russia's uh, strengthening position on the battlefield leads to escalation there. And so you know, during this next few months, I think oil is a proxy for geopolitical risk. I do wonder uh, how OPEC is responding to two, the two fronts. First, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine, and second, the war going on in Israel. Uh, Iran being one of the members of OPEC, one of the largest producers of the OPEC, um, is currently in a feud, of course, with, uh, with the allies of Israel. And so eyes are on what Iran and OPEC are going to do in response. What is your take? Yeah, I think this is the the big question, and I think this is why oil, you know, Brent is at ninety dollars this weekend. I, I, if it weren't for what's going on in the Middle East, I think oil would be substantially lower than it is today. And so, um, same situation. I think a very underreported event this week was um, this bombing of the Iranian consulate in Syria, which Iran claims was a diplomatic mission and in violation of the UN Charter and so on. And Israel did that, and I, I suspect the White House isn't super excited about that development itself. Um, so much like um, 
you know, the Houthis in the Red Sea are viewed over here as a proxy for Iran. Well, you know, we're certainly fighting a proxy war uh, with Ukraine and Russia. And and people would say that Israel um, is being militarily armed by the U.S. And so it, and to the extent that, um, you know, we're on one side of that war, it would be on Israel's side. But your proxies don't always behave in ways that you find acceptable. And I, I suspect that, for example, Iran would probably say that it would, would prefer the Houthis to stand down. I don't think it's in Iran's interest today to get into a kinetic war with the U.S., and um, if Israel has decided it's strategically important to provoke one, um, then they might drag the U.S. into a situation that it hadn't planned for, which is, again, one of the reasons why we say it, it, you know, getting into wars, um, you, sometimes you lose them. <laughs> it's not always a good deal to get into a war. And so um, back to the original question, I, I just think when I look at the price of oil today, I don't see physical supply demand imbalances that would justify $90 a barrel Brent. I see war premium baked into um the price it's like it's like pricing an option like if, if things go really pear-shaped in the middle east right now you could see 200 dollars a barrel oil and so you have to game theory that risk into the current price and i think that's what's going on right but do break the uh, the war in uh the gaza strip broke out in october and as you recall back then the oil price did not rise yep. immediately in fact, it went down um and then just stay sideways so uh, one could argue that the recent surge has nothing to do with the Middle East, because that's already happened. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so it's a fascinating chart um, that I, we haven't published yet, but I shared with a, a friend's a subscriber base yesterday. If you plot um, landed LNG prices in Europe, multiply that number by 5.6 and compare it against WTI, you're basically getting um, where oil could or should trade. So um, because of the energy content, there's 5.6 times as much energy uh, in a barrel of oil. Uh, than there is in a million BTUs of natural gas. And so um, 5.6 times LNG in Europe is about $50 a barrel oil. And those things did trade in equilibrium between like October and early December. So to your point, when October 7th happened, I think the market was pricing in that this would stay contained, um, that it wouldn't escalate. Two things have changed. Uh, in December, I think it became apparent in the West that the war was not going well in Ukraine. And it looks like the beginnings of potential escalatory uh, attacks, you know, the Houthis, the Red Sea, all of that stuff started to happen um, a, a few months after the original October 7th incident. And that's when you begin to see this deviation in the price of landed LNG in Europe versus um, WTI or Brent. And I think the market is now pricing in geopolitical risk. Uh, I, I think the physical markets are well supplied. Uh, the fungibility of oil and natural gas and coal indicates that they should roughly trade in parity to their BTU content. They they often don't. And when there's huge disparities between where they should be, I think the market is trying to tell us something. And in this case, I think the market is saying oil in particular has, has high geopolitical risk. Okay. Um, also coming out of earlier this week, OPEC Plus met and decided to keep uh, their supply steady. As as Brent nears ninety dollars a barrel, as you as you discussed, I'll just read another paragraph from this Reuters article. A meeting of top OPEC plus ministers kept oil supply policy unchanged and pressed some countries to increase compliance output cuts. A decision a decision that spurred international crude prices to the highest in five months at nearly ninety dollars a barrel. So besides obviously the tensions in the Middle East, what do you think OPEC's priority is right now? I think I think OPEC is perfectly happy with any oil price between 70 and 90 dollars a barrel and if oil is at 90 dollars a barrel and they they can maintain their existing production i think they'll be very happy with that and so um there's no need for them to increase supply because they you know anybody who's worked in commodities knows you make all your money on price and at 90 dollars a barrel brent that's kind of the upper end of the sweet spot for opec plus i would say <clears throat> saudi arabia for example would not be comfortable with 110 or 120 dollar oil even though they're making far more money at that price because then they worry about tripping um, the, the world into a recession. And so $90 is right down the middle in the sweet spot for OPEC plus. So I would say standing pat and producing at their current rate is their objective. And and what you said was very important. They're worried about people um, cheating, be, uh, trying to get a few extra bucks in at $90 and producing more. Um, they, they would like to stay here. If, if you said, we'll give you $90 a barrel Brent for the next 10 years sold, like they would take it. Um, and every producer in the world would be thrilled with that. And so um, 70 to 90 is the range. We're at the top end of that range. If we break out of that range, I think um, you would see OPEC beginning to produce more to bring it back into that range. It, it, going back to what you said earlier, if you think that 
there is a geopolitical risk premium baked into the price by the order of 20 to 30 bucks, and that there's no reason or physical reason for oil to be trading this high besides war. Do you then, can we assume that this is really the upper end of the price range that we'll see for the remainder of the year? Well, not if, if war progresses. A kinetic conflict between the U.S. and Iran, or in this case, U.S. proxy Israel and Iran, you could see 150 or $200 oil. Um, I, the inelasticity of primary energy is profound. This is how you go from minus $27 at COVID to $130 a barrel at the outbreak of the war. I'm just going to slightly challenge that, um, if I may. So if we, if we analyze oil production today versus, let's say, 30 years ago during the Gulf War, for example, yes, I mean, when the war breaks out in the Middle East, uh, oil refineries in that region being challenged or endangered actually has an impact on the production of oil worldwide. But now, as you know, shale gas production in the U.S. accounts for majority of production as well. So I, one could argue that a war breaking out in the Middle East, even a kinetic war between Iran and the U.S., may not actually influence the supply of oil much. Would you agree or disagree well, with that? I would, I would disagree. And also, I would say there's a major difference between now and the early 1990s, which is we had James Baker as a secretary of state who people respected. And before we sent all of those troops into Kuwait to expel um, Saddam Hussein's Iraq from that country, um, he went around the world and, and bent the ear of the oil producers and they flooded the market with supply. And that's not happening today. Um, we don't have the same diplomatic pull that we did back then. Um, OPEC plus uh, is aligned with Russia, for example, um, in, in this conflict. And so we're not flooding the world with supply. OPEC is continuing to maintain its production cuts and so on. I will say, think about what happened when Joe Biden released 1 million barrels a day for six months from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. He cut the price of oil in half. This tells you that the, the inelasticity indicates that very small disruptions can have disproportionate impacts on price because oil is a flow. It flows 100 million barrels a day every day. You interrupt 5 million barrels of that you're going to see prices skyrocket. So if 1 million barrels a day, which is 1% of global supply for half a year, cut the price of oil in half, what does a sudden knockout of 4 million barrels a day, 5 million barrels a day due to the price of oil? I think it goes to 150 or 200 in a heartbeat. And that's why this sort of Black-Scholes call option valuation of, of that potential geopolitical risk explains the size and the persistence of what we believe is the uh, geopolitical risk premium um, and so, and I think it's a fair price. I think the market is telling us something and we should listen to it, right? Like with coal back at $125 a ton and, you know, um, natural gas given away for free in the U.S., but oil is still sitting here at $90. That can only be geopolitics. Speaking of the SBR, since you mentioned that, so Biden's administration recently canceled uh, SBR purchases. Uh, this came in last week or this week, rather. Uh an article from Forbes, despite indicating they would refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, SPR, by the end of this year, the Department of Energy has now canceled solicitations offered last month. Why, why did this happen? They're never going to refill the SPR, uh, certainly not under a democratic regime or without complete control of Congress, because um, at all times, this will be viewed as a uh, subsidy and a handout to the fossil fuel industry and is politically unpalatable to the current administration. Um, uh, when oil was at 60 or 70, they put in a few million barrels, but if you actually plot the SPR volume on a five-year chart, this was just tinkering around at the margins. I mean, they drained half the SPR and they put back like two or three percent of it. They were never going to refill it by the end of the year. That had to be an erroneous headline. I think there was some math in there about them canceling forced sales. And so the, the, the claim was actually SPR will be where it would have been if we didn't cancel these other mandated sales that Congress had passed over the years. You should know that for the better part of a decade, in order to uh, gain the scoring at the Congressional Budget Office, Congress mandated that the DOE sell 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 million barrels of oil out of the SPR in order to, quote, balance the budget of these. Uh, and so canceling those is not the same as refilling it to where it was. And I think the, the, the headline was misunderstood as saying, we will have the SPR back to where it would have been if we hadn't canceled these um, you know, if we had gone through with these congressionally mandated sales. And so there was a bit of a spin going on there. If you actually just look at the inventory levels of the SPR um, on your Bloomberg terminal, you will see that there's no chance that this would have been refilled by the end of the year. Yeah, it's currently at around, I, I, you know, I'm getting my numbers uh, on, on, on the internet, so correct me if I'm wrong, but 363 million barrels, I believe, yes. uh, which is like close to half of what it was a couple of years ago. 
I, I believe the purpose of the SPR is to relieve the U.S. of any um, shocks to the supply in case of war or another cat- catastrophe or emergency. So my question is, do you think 363 million barrels is sufficient to, to satisfy this purpose? It's a great question, and I think probably yes, because when the SPR was first conceived and filled, we were coming off of the OPEC supply crisis of the 1970s. And most importantly, every major policy decision maker in the U.S. was uh, believing in Hubbard's peak because U.S. oil had peaked in the 70s and began a multi-decade decline. Now we're, as you mentioned, the largest producer of oil and gas the world has ever seen. Um, and and we, we, we're swimming in cheap hydrocarbons. And so um, we are a net energy exporter of significant scale. We've added two and a half Saudi Arabia since the onset of the shale revolution. And so maybe we don't need 700 million barrels of oil in the SPR like we had when Trump was president. Maybe 360 is sufficient. But this thought that we were going to take 300 million barrels off the market by the end of the year and put it in the SPR, I, I never believed that headline. I didn't understand it when I saw it. And now I'm not surprised that um, that's been walked back. Mm. You mentioned earlier that um, a higher oil price could trigger a recession. That's something that people want to avoid, especially OPEC. Uh, Now, obviously, nobody knows, but do you have an idea um, as to how high this number could be before a recession is triggered by by oil? I mean, if we just speculate. Yeah, I was thinking offsetting that is this amazing glut of natural gas, especially in the U.S. And we wrote a piece describing how natural gas is a key input into what still is a pretty formidable manufacturing vertical here in North America. Mexico, the US and Canada produce a lot of things, chemicals, paints, coatings, um, agriculture, uh, f- fertilizer, you name it, and having dirt cheap natural gas. Natural gas costs less than a medium fry at McDonald's today. A, mil- a million BTUs of natural gas is a milkshake at McDonald's. It's incredible. Um, it's actually negative in the Permian today. They're, they're paying people to take natural gas. So when you have an abundance of cheap hydrocarbons, it's hard to get into a recession. Now, for the rest of the world, Europe, for example, which is probably already in a recession, I think $120, $130, $150 oil would would push them over the top. It would also hurt China. It would hurt the energy importing nations like Japan and China. And so um, on balance, it would be a significant economic headwind. Um, Not sure it would tip the U.S. into a recession just because we just have this abundance of dirt cheap hydrocarbons that we don't even know what to do with. Okay, uh, looking ahead at the future of the energy market, this is a story that came out of Canada um, earlier in uh, well, early in the year, late last year, December 2023. Uh, the country has laid out plans to phase out the sale of gas-powered cars and trucks by 2035. Canada now joins a host of other nations and jurisdictions in the U.S. that have similar goals. I wonder if the um, if the uh, futures curve of oil has priced these plans in at all, Doomberg. Um, the anticipation of you know fewer car uh, uh, ice trucks uh, cars and trucks on on the road. This is this is, this yeah. is utter nonsense. Okay. It's not going to happen. Okay. Justin Trudeau is trailing by 18 points in the last polls I saw. He's going to get wiped out of office, and the first thing that happens is they're going to restore sanity to their energy policy. I would fade our ability to remove ice vehicles from the market by 2035. I would that's a trade I would make. There aren't any sure bets in life. I can assure you that in the cold white north of Canada, they will be burning diesel and gasoline for a very long time. That, that's, that's a sucker bet to think otherwise. You know what's interesting is I've noticed industry, uh, the auto industry kind of reversing this trend. Um, just to name one example, Mercedes promised to have only electric cars by 2030. Two years ago, they have since earlier this year reversed that promise. They are saying that's no longer happening. It's just interesting to see how the auto industry is actually responding to these policies. Do you think, uh, 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 yeah, what do you think yeah, is going to happen? I, I, I'll leave you with, uh, with a, a far out there prediction. By 2035, more, um, more vehicles in the U.S., Canada, um, which includes heavy-duty long-haul trucks, passenger vehicles, um, tractors, a- any combustion engine in, in, in the North America. There will be more compressed natural gas engines than there are BEVs um, being produced in 2035. I just think um, this has been a luxury. Um, we will get over this. The politics of it are clearly turning. We called peak ESG at COP28 um, in November, and I think that call will be proven prescient. I think the world is going to shift towards natural gas and nuclear. Um, and I think 
CNG, compressed natural gas. We have such an abundance of natural gas in North America. Um, the, 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 at a, at two dollars a million BTU natural gas, that's the equivalent of ten, fifty, eleven dollars a barrel oil. Um, you're not going to be filling your trucks with diesel when you could make a CNG engine that provides the same work at at you know uh, one tenth of the cost. So if you look, Cummins' new 15 liter um, natural gas engine is rolling out. It has already been successful in China. Um, we're writing about this company, uh, Liberty Energy, that is providing. Um, CNG services to the oil patch because they have all this gas there. And I think um, natural gas powered engines are cleaner, no knocks, much better than diesel. We have an ample supply of it. The technology is known and solved. Uh, this is what we're going to do. Um, this is how we're going to uh, clean up air pollution um, and move away from BEVs. You know, the, the environmental impact of battery powered transportation is profound. And I, I would argue clean burning natural gas. Is, is probably better for the environment. So um, will Justin Trudeau still be prime minister in Canada in 2035? Of course not. Will Joe Biden or Donald Trump still be in charge of the U.S. government in 2035? Of course not. Physics mandates what will happen, and the rest is just politics. And, and I, I, that's a, maybe that prediction will look foolish. Uh, it's not zero in my view. I brought up um, the case of Mercedes as a point to illustrate that the consumer ultimately wins, right? What the consumer wants will dictate what the industry provides, which will ultimately dictate what's in the market. So what do you think the consumer wants in the next decade? Well, the consumer wants to be able to transport themselves from A to B as cheaply as possible and as conveniently as possible. So I'll give you an, an example. Um, in the northern states of the U.S., the, a, a, a substantial majority of people heat their homes with natural gas. You can imagine hooking up a natural gas refilling station in your garage and burning two dollars per million btu natural gas instead of gasoline it it it's going to happen engines will be switched like uh, energy arbitrage drives behaviors we are sitting in the us on the world's largest supply of cheap hydrocarbons that has ever been seen that will affect the economy that will affect behaviors isn't the electric car then just the cheapest option well no because you have to mine all the batteries material well for the batteries. consumer that is i mean the, i mean yes well if the batteries. government's going to pay you sure um, but uh, by the way people are rejecting electric vehicles because they don't satisfy the mission you can't you have to recharge every 300 miles right so if we have a major battery breakthrough where you can get a thousand miles of range before recharging that will change the game and you know we keep a close eye on solid state batteries and especially the work that toyota is doing i think the future for gasoline cars is hybrid plug-in hybrid, um, where you have a, a 20 kilowatt hour battery that takes care of 90% of your emissions and you still refuel with gasoline. But by the way, if we don't burn as much gasoline in the West because we can afford the luxuries of buying plug-in hybrid cars, that just means the developed world, developing world is going to go ahead and buy that extra increment of gasoline. The gating factor to CO2 emissions is fossil fuel production. Every molecule of fossil fuel produced will be burned by somebody somewhere and local restrictions against that merely shift who will enjoy that benefit. And the developing world, which uh, in a piece we're publishing uh, tomorrow, um, they consume, uh, we consume in the West, in the G7, we consume 3.4 times as much energy per capita than the rest of the world. They want to climb that ladder and who are we to stop them? They will climb that ladder. The piece we're publishing is on this amazing uh, BBC reporter interview with the president of Guyana and whether they should keep all the oil in the ground in the name of climate change. It's ludicrous. Do you know? that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined, a forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon, a forest that we have kept alive, a forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, give no, you that, the right to release all of this carbon? Right? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Guyana has kept alive. They're not going to. They're going to enrich their people. They're going to climb Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And who are we to say they shouldn't? Um, and so um, all the coal in the world will get burned. Um, the G7 only accounts for 11% of global coal production right now. Since 1965, the non-G7 countries have increased their coal burning fivefold. Like this is what this is where the world is going to go. So if we decide, Trudeau decides that you can't have ice cars in Canada, that's just going to make gasoline cheaper somewhere else and they're going to buy it. That's what's going to happen. Okay, well, ultimately, do you see any scenario that could push crude down to below $70 a barrel 
by the end of the year? Sure, peace could break out in the Middle East. Um, you know, we um, we could reach an agreement with uh, with uh, with Putin. But as as unrealistic as that seems today, I mean, if geopolitical risk is what's driving the price of oil today, anything that deflates that geopolitical risk uh, will. This is just an will, out there. This is just an out there thought. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, the, the people running these countries are smart people. If they realize the same thing that you just said, would it not be in their own self interest to prolong this conflict? Uh, for the oil producers, sure. Um, but oil producer the, countries, the, Iran, sure, Russia. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think Iran. I don't. I. I. I think these countries would like to peacefully make as much money as they can between seventy dollars and ninety dollars a barrel of oil, and 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 they don't want to risk um, World War Three. Like if you're MBS in Saudi Arabia, you're living a pretty good life, right? I mean, do you really need a nuclear bomb going off or do you a terrorist attack shooting up your concert hall in Moscow, for example, like we saw a couple of weeks ago? Um, and I think, by the way, like the election of Donald Trump, I think would be deeply bearish for oil. Um, bearish? Why is that? Very, very bearish for oil because he would he would cut a peace deal. He said so on the campaign trail. Um, he like he's. We did not have a war when Donald Trump was president. Whatever you think of the man, and Lord knows he's an in interesting person to observe agnostically as a nonpartisan like we are. Um, he has said explicitly that um, he would cut a deal with Putin. He would stop the war in the Middle East. If those two things happened, I think oil re-rates at $50 a barrel overnight. Now, do I think Trump's going to get elected? I don't know. Um, do I think if he got elected, half the country would accept that result? Probably not. So if he got a clean election, I think oil would drop. If there's a disputed election in the US, that's a geopolitical risk. I think oil could go up. Um, he's a drill baby drill guy, right? I mean, like the the oil and gas industry in North America is the biggest beneficiary of the Biden administration. I mean, it just is. They've, they're making way more money under Biden than they did under Trump. And Trump has said explicitly um, that he would cut a deal with Russia and the war and, he, and the war in the Middle East. If that happens, oil's going down, not going up. All right. Well, keep tabs on that. Thank you. Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit more about your work on the Doomberg Substack. So you've already mentioned one of your upcoming pieces. Here's a piece you wrote couple of months ago. Peak cheap oil is a myth. Um, I'm not going to show the entire article, but please summarize your findings for us. Sure. I, this, this piece created far more controversy than we anticipated, but um, we've long believed that um, politics is the main driver of any shortages of fossil fuels. Uh, it's certainly not geology. Uh, we in the U.S., produce 20% of the world's quote unquote oil defined broadly and 25 to 30% of the world's natural gas with a hand and a half tied behind our back. We can't drill in California. We can't drill uh, in the uh, Eastern part of the Gulf of Mexico. We can't drill off any of the coastline of Florida or most of the Atlantic basin. There's a giant shale deposit in California that's off limits to people. These are all political choices. Um, Venezuela is a political basket case. It, it produced 4 million barrels a day. It's now down to one. It could do six or seven easily if it had good politics and good infrastructure. There's giant shale all over the world, Argentina, Russia, even China has its own shale. Um, we are nowhere near running out of fossil fuels. Um, the definition of oil is expanding. Our preferred definition of oil is any hydrocarbon that finds its way into the refinery network. Um, natural gas will eventually be oil. You could you could change the engines or you could change the molecules, and we will do both if arbitrage opens up wide enough. There's way more than enough hydrocarbons for way long enough. And uh, anybody who's peddling the myth of peak cheap oil is, is probably trying to sell you on something. And unfortunately, there's an, enough people in the world that are willing to uh, to pay for such uh, prognostications. Um, so I, I just think, like, yes, oil could go to $200 a barrel. That would not be peak cheap oil. Um, that would be a, a an expression of the inelasticity of demand for oil and geopolitical risk that caused that event. Um, and by the way, the, the, the higher oil spikes, the quicker it will dissipate back to the mean because um, there are options and we would use them. Political opposition to the development of energy would be wiped away. Energy is life. Everybody everywhere wants a higher standard of living. And any politician who gets in the way of that, especially in the face of a crisis, will be wiped, wiped aside either by the boats or by violence. And, and we've seen both. Uh, the, um, this, the theory of peak oil is largely based on, as you know, the Hubbard curve, uh, yes. developed by Marion Hubbard, who worked for Shell in the 1950s, I believe. What assumptions has he made that are, I guess, either wrong or not applicable today? Um, so all peak cheap oil prognostications are basically short bets on human ingenuity. And any backward-looking data 
rate counts, well productivity, all of that ignores the exponential pace of technology development. The development of AI is a virtuous circle, for example. It's going to lead to more energy production because we need that energy to power the data centers that are producing the AI. Like, we are going to solve the problem. Um, before shale was a thing, it would have been, you would have sound crazy to have predicted what it grew to, right? And, and shale exploitation is basically illegal in a bunch of European countries. Um, that, that's, those are political choices, right? And politics will not survive an energy crisis. Like, that's our view. And it's been played out over and over again. So for example, when the US oil peaked, quote unquote, in the 70s, it's now since vastly surpassed that with shale, global oil production has doubled since then. The primary energy production grows 2% per year every year in a slightly sinusoidal upward sloping curve. And the, the crisis creates the new supply. Um, uh, that's just it. Like we can, we can produce. If natural gas was $5 a million BTU in the US today, we could probably produce 20% more than we're producing. We're seeing curtailments. Right, but barring another fracking moment, which is currently unforeseen, isn't the current supply of oil and natural gas in the ground finite? Well, of course it's finite. I said more than enough for more than long enough is my view. For like a discounted cash flow basis, uh, do you need to be worrying about running out of fossil fuels in the next 50 years? No. So what? take what you just said, barring another shale moment. The U.S. has a tiny fraction of the global shale resource. We just have this weird land rights slash state management of uh, state level management, uh, regulatory management of, of energy production, such that Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and North Dakota can run their own show. Um, because they're, you know, if it's captive within a state, then the, the federal government has less say. But those are all political choices. Like there's a giant shale deposit in Argentina. I find it interesting that Malay just shows up uh, all of a sudden out of nowhere. There's a giant shale deposit in Russia. There are significant shale deposits in China. And to think the Chinese aren't just going to steal all our technology in order to become energy self-sufficient, of course they're going to. So by hook or by crook, it is a sucker bet to fade human ingenuity. Um, it's a fight between geology and the technical singularity, and the technical singularity is going to win. That's our view. People disagree with it. That's our view. Doomberg, excellent commentary as always. Thank you very much. Where can we learn from you? Where can we visit your Substack? Yeah, so we're actually sort of um, in the middle of transitioning from doomberg.substack.com to doomberg.com. We have paid off. We've paid off a uh, squatter, and we're launching so that page uh, as we speak. And so, oh, I see. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, a yeah. new website. Congratulations! Yeah, it's great. New yeah. website. Yeah. So um, we're trying to professionalize our organization as always because we are, you know, with this hobby has grown into the work of our lives. And so doomberg.com is a place, but if you go to doomberg.substack.com, I think you'll just get redirected. Eventually it'll be worked out by the time you publish this, but um, we're in transition and I'm um, looking forward to um, Doomberg 2.0. Yeah, congratulations on the launch. You have currently 200,000 plus subscribers, I think, of your yeah, Substack. 220. 220, and one climbing. of those precious. Yeah. And also I mentioned, I'll have to mention that you're also on Twitter. Right, how many followers do you have on uh, Twitter currently here? Uh, not anymore. We left Twitter in August because they were um, suppressing Substack links. But you can find us on Substack Notes, which is the equivalent of uh, 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 the, their version of Twitter. Um, and everything we're doing is on Substack. We're equity investors in Substack. They're great partners for us. There'd be no Doomberg without them. We love the team. So um, you can find us exclusively on, on Substack, uh, uh, doomberg.substack.com or doomberg.com, either one. That's interesting. All right, we'll put the link down the description below. Thank you very much, Doomberg, for your time today. Always amazing to talk to you, David. And again, many congratulations. And so fun to watch you succeed. Looking forward to coming back again. Yeah, we'll speak soon. Lots to talk about in the energy markets for sure. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.